With support from the NIHCM, or the National Institute for Healthcare Management, we've created a three-episode series about how drugs get approved in the United States, the exceptions to the normal rules of approval, and what some major issues have been and how things have changed or may change in the future. In the first episode, we discussed the drug approval process, from the discovery phase to what happens after approval. In the second episode, we talked about what happens when the usual rules don't apply. And in this third and final episode, we'll discuss conflicting opinions about the FDA's drug approval standards, including some major recent drug controversies. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Drug approval and access in the United States is a contentious topic. Some people think we aren't lenient enough in this regard, and others think we are far too lenient. Let's begin with those who think we aren't lenient enough, starting with the question, is the FDA too risk averse, both in general and in accelerated and or emergency situations? According to a 2010 article in The Atlantic, The number of clinical trials needed for a new drug application and the number of patients needed in those trials have risen dramatically. These increased requirements have more than quadrupled the cost of the clinical trial stage. Some argue that this increased cost leads to decreased innovation, particularly when it comes to rare diseases. And beyond cost, many argue that today's drug development standards are preventing generally useful drugs from making it to market. To exemplify this, many point to aspirin and penicillin. As mentioned in that Atlantic article, it's unlikely that either of these drugs would have been approved by the FDA if they were discovered today, mostly thanks to associated safety issues. But they have each made dramatic differences in our medical landscape. And of course, there are many proponents of right to try, which excludes the FDA altogether and provides another avenue for terminally ill patients to gain access to investigational drugs. The Right to Try Act was signed into law in May of 2018 and is touted as an effort to bring hope to patients who have tried all government approved options. Those are pretty good arguments, right? So what are people on the opposite side, meaning those who say the FDA is already too lenient, saying? We'll start with Agihelm, one of the most recent controversies. Agihelm was granted accelerated approval in June of 2021 based on its ability to reduce plaques in the brain that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. Plaque reduction is a surrogate endpoint, so the expectation is that post-approval trials will be conducted to demonstrate that the drug reduces actual Alzheimer's symptoms, which is the clinical endpoint. We are still awaiting those trials, but it was a major controversy for the drug to be approved in the first place. One of its two major clinical trials reported no significant difference from a placebo. Normally, a drug wouldn't obtain approval with such mixed evidence, but this one did, even in the face of almost unanimous disapproval from the advisory committee. This was so controversial that several major medical institutions refused to offer the drug to patients. And speaking of accelerated approvals, a 2021 article published in the BMJ points out that since the accelerated approval option began in 1992, some 44% of the drugs approved via this pathway have yet to be proven clinically effective. As was the case with Agihelm, drugs can receive accelerated approval based on surrogate endpoints, but they are required to continue on to prove that clinical endpoints are improved. According to that BMJ article, almost half of them aren't doing that. That means people may be paying for drugs that don't actually make any difference. One of those drugs was on the market for 12 years before the FDA asked the drug maker to take it off since they'd never done the trials to confirm clinical efficacy. We should probably also hit on another major public controversy, the opioid crisis. The FDA's approval of extended release oxycodone in the 90s did not indicate the limited conditions for which the benefits of oxycodone outweighed the risks, leaving it to be used for pain conditions where the risks were far greater than any relief provided to the patient, resulting in countless overdose deaths. So what about that Right to Try Act we mentioned? What could possibly be an argument against providing some last-ditch effort for a patient facing certain death? One of the main arguments is that Right to Try is simply an effort to undermine the FDA because the FDA's expanded access pathway, which we discussed in our last episode, 
basically provides these exact options to terminally ill patients and rarely denies their requests. One major difference is that under the FDA's expanded access pathway, the request is reviewed to determine whether the drug will be more beneficial than harmful, and the treatment protocol must be approved by an institutional review board. This kind of oversight is meant to reduce potential harm to the patient, including the chance of dying earlier or more painfully than they otherwise would have, which are important considerations. In the grand scheme of things, we sometimes get it right, like when we provide emergency authorization for things like the COVID vaccines, where the data are clear on both safety and efficacy. Sometimes we get it wrong, and we rush a drug that clearly isn't ready for approval, as was the case with Agilhelm. And sometimes it's clear that we're being far too cautious, as was the case with the FDA's hesitancy to approve many rapid COVID tests earlier in the pandemic. So what do I think about all this? We 100% need to be on top of verifying the clinical efficacy of drugs following an accelerated approval. Also, I do think some safety oversight is reasonable, even when providing investigational drugs to terminally ill patients. So I prefer the FDA's expanded access option to the right to try avenue. Other than that, I think there are many factors related to each drug that need to be scrutinized along with the data calling for case-by-case -case decisions. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You'd enjoy the entire series, and we encourage you to go watch it. It's only three episodes, including this one. We also appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel and like this video, and consider going to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help make the show bigger and better. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sebitz, Edward Lillahome, and Brian Nam, and of course, our surgeon admiral, Sam.